This is Aaron Wiesner of Local Future, and we are live with Dr. Jonathan Belcom. Dr. Belcom is a PhD in animal behavior and an author of several books on the inner lives of animals. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. How are you today? Good to be here, Aaron. I'm doing great, thanks. So Jonathan, I've seen your talks a few times um, in person, and I imagine you have some online, but what interests me most is about emotions in the inside of animals and how that is similar to emotions that humans have, and humans are animals as well. But before we do that, can you just um, share with us, what is your interest in the inner lives of animals? I mean, why are you studying this? Why, why did you get a PhD in the study of animal behavior. Yeah, by the time I reached that stage in my career as a student, I'd done an undergraduate degree in biology. I always was attracted and drawn and interested interested in animals, and then a master's degree in biology. And by that time, by the time it was time to decide, do I want to continue to a PhD? Uh, I was becoming more uh, aware of my desire to be an advocate, to work for animals, to try and make the world better for them. You don't have to have your eyes open too wide to be able to recognize that the world is a far from ideal place for uh, non-human animals. Um, so um, I figured getting a PhD would would make me a more, perhaps a more effective or perhaps a more qualified spokesperson for animals. So that was my primary des des drive at that stage and has continued to be. And so when you were working on your master's degree, and your PhD, studies, you normally have to write a paper of some sort. So what sort of um, studies were you doing at the time? Yeah, back in, it's very true. You have to focus. It's, uh, you have to focus pretty specifically on something. Um, so my, my master's and PhD, my, my undergraduate thesis was on nesting in turtles here in Ontario, Canada, where I, I recently returned to live a couple of years ago after 31 years in the States. Um, but then my master's and, and PhD were on communication in bats. For my master's, I studied a phenomenon sort of loosely called um, eavesdropping, where uh, I've lost the visual of you. I don't know if that's OK. Was that something you did? Are you there, Aaron? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just feeling tiny little smidgens of your voice. So we're not connect the connection is not working very well, I'm afraid. Let me try switching to a different connection. Just okay. give me a moment here. Okay, can you turn your camera back on, please, Jonathan? Oh, I didn't realize it had gone off. But according to this uh, video, it's right. on. Let All right. Me. I'm so sorry. We're going to have to back up to that previous question. So you were talking about your master's degree and your PhD, and you're doing something about communication in bats. Are you saying that bats communicate with one another? I mean, is that what your study found? Oh, absolutely. And that was well known before I did. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's over 1300 odd species of bats in the world. And most of them haven't been studied in much detail, but uh, there are dozens and dozens of, of, of bats who have, whose lives have been studied. And there's no controversy among scientists that bats communicate with each other. In fact, bats auto communicate. They communicate with themselves in an unusual way, although it's used by some other animals and that's echolocation where they actually listen to the echoes of their own vocalizations while they're flying around in the dark. It allows them to orient in the dark to avoid flying into a tree because the echo tells them there's a tree there, but also to find food if they're aerial insectivores, which a lot of them are. So they're able to actually detect the presence of a mosquito or a, another insect flying and they can hone in on that with the echoes. Quite remarkable. So auto communication, in this case, echolocation is very important to bats, but also there's a whole, um, there's a whole universe of, of vocal communication that happens socially. 
uh, either on the wing, but more typically in the roost when the bats are resting and they're hanging upside down in a cave or in a tree or somewhere, then there's lots of vocalizations, usually low, lower pitch. A lot of those we can hear, they're very high, but we can hear them unlike the echolocation, which tends to be ultrasonic, which simply means beyond our level of hearing. So yeah, there's communication uh, among individuals in the roost going on all the time and communication in parents and their offspring I studied vocal recognition in Mexican tree-tailed bats. So the role that vocal voice recognition plays in mothers being able to reunite with their single pups. Each mom has one baby and that baby is left in a cave with several million other pups, depending on the size of the cave. How on earth does she find hers among the throng that are all swarmed across this, this cave walls? She's able to do it with a combination of spatial memory, vocal recognition and smell recognition. They, each individual bat has a vocal signature and a smell signature. And with that combination of cues, uh, she knows it's her baby and she, she will nurse that one in particular. And you're referring to bats again? Yes, bats. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, uh, it's, it sounds like bats are, are very, they, they, Humans and bats exhibit many similar behaviors then, as far as nurturing, for example. Is, totally. is that fair to say uh, that mammals are very similar? Yes, it's, it's fair to say. Uh, I mean, a mother bat, this is a mammal. She produces milk for her young. That's, dying. that's you know, all mammals, it defines mammals. Um, and uh, so there's a very big investment that a mother bat makes in her pup. The fact that she only has one in a given year probably amplifies that particular investment per individual. So there's one cherished baby and that's the one she's caring for. And that entails when the pup is very young, she unites with the pup several times a day to nurse. Uh, these particular in that, it depends on the species, but um, in the species I studied, it's very warm in those caves because of all the bodies, all the warm bodies. So she doesn't need to keep the bat warm, but in some other species where there may be single roosts or just a few individuals in a roost, then maybe keeping them warm is important, particularly on cold nights. Um, and then she, she nurses the bat, the bat many times a day. And then when she flies out at night to get to forage, to catch insects, she's leaving her baby in the cave. And uh, that may be, she may go out several times, depending on the species, depending on the night, depending on the conditions. And then she feeds herself and hopefully doesn't get preyed upon because if she does, then the little pup back in the cave is probably not gonna survive. I say probably because there is some evidence of adoption. Uh, at least in the Mexican free tail bat that I studied, there's evidence that a, a bereft mother who's lost her pup may adopt a bereft pup who's lost his or her mother. So uh, th there's some support for that. And I guess it's a way to complete, to avoid completely uh, a wasted reproductive season. You know, whether they're thinking all of that stuff, I think most animals do things for the reasons that we do them. We have an intrinsic uh, desire to do it. Uh, it's not necessarily instinctual, but our emotions tell us what we want to do and we tend to obey those feelings. So similarly with them. So in many ways, their communication, their social life parallels ours. I can elaborate on just another aspect that comes to mind. Just consider the thanks. Just consider the challenge of being a baby bat who is not flying yet, not echolocating, not catching insects, and then going from a roosting animal who's never flown, maybe crawled around and flapped their wings, but they haven't actually flown. It's like birds leaving the nest for the first time. It's an incredible juncture in their life, a very critical one. But you think of that vast difference between staying in one place and not having to catch things and then going and starting to fly. I think it's pretty clear that you, you're not gonna be able to do all that right off the bat. It is a, there's a, there's a, a period of learning and, uh, and honing your skills. And uh, it's, it's pretty clear that most bats, if not probably all bats and for other animals too, there's that sort of apprenticeship stage where the young one is starting to be independent but is still dependent on the mother. So reunions between those bats probably happen for weeks after the time that the bat first leaves the roost, just as birds who leave the nest uh, routinely are continued to be fed by their parents for days or weeks thereafter. So it's a pretty long-term caring arrangement. And then back to sort of something you mentioned earlier, we may, we may guess that emotions, you know, the emotional connection between the parent and the offspring becomes pretty strong during this pe intense period of their lives. 
if you were to um, describe this as, a, as a, the parenting relationship in like the terms that humans describe it, like the strict father versus the nurturing mother versus the, you know, kind of the guiding mother or whatever. It, it, are those terms that you could apply to animals as well? Historically, scientists have been uncomfortable with uh, anthropomorphizing animals, but as we learn more about them, we see more parallels, more similarities, and it becomes a little bit dogmatic for us to deny emotions such as love uh, to them. Scientists still don't typically use that, that, that word, for instance, but they'll talk about the bonding that happens, the intensely close relationship, and we could speculate on, on how those manifest in the feelings of the animals. And the more we look and the more we're open to emotions in animals, the more we see that their lives are emotional lives, just as our lives are emotional lives. Are they having the same uh, experience as we are? Perhaps not always, um, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that our feelings are more felt, felt more intensely than theirs. It depends on the species. It depends on the situation. Um, and I think we, we do ourselves wrong to think that we're at the pinnacle of all these, of all these uh, characteristics of life. I think uh, other animals can feel emotions in some contexts, in some species more intensely than we can. Maybe it doesn't matter. I think the important thing is they're sentient. They have feelings, they can feel pain and pleasure, and they can feel a spectrum of emotions. Um, and uh, that makes them important. That makes their lives uh, meaningful and it means their lives matter. We've got this, this social movement right now, Black Lives Matter. It's a lovely phrase. Uh, I, I work on, on trying to get people to realize that animals' lives matter too. Our, our, in, in our household, there is a cat who adopted us. The cat showed up one day and just never left. And we're out, we're kind of out in the country. Just hung out, just kept hanging out, hanging out, hanging out for months at a time. Eventually we offered it water. Eventually in wintertime, we offered it food, but it just never left, it adopted us. And now it lives with us, it's, it's part of our family. Um, so the emotions of this, this cat, Shadow, um, the emotions of, of dogs and things like that, are, are those, can those be in any way really compared to human emotions? Yes, I think it's fine to try and compare, but it's also um, a little restricting. Um, there's, a, there's an important thing that needs to be said here, and that is one of the, the primary reason why, well, not, maybe not the primary reason, but certainly a key reason why scientists have been so reluctant to talk about animal emotions until only just recent decades when it's become more in vogue to do so. And that's the privacy issue. The fact is that other animals and other individuals, you cannot actually experience what they're experiencing. You know, to be again dogmatic, I cannot experience what Aaron Weisner is experiencing right now. I can, I can guess based on the fact we're both human beings and we're having this conversation, and your inner world is probably similar to mine. Uh, maybe I had something at lunch that gave me indigestion or you're worried about something going on later in your life or something currently in your life. So those things may affect your affect, how you're feeling and how I'm feeling. But nevertheless, we generally make assumptions about how our fellow humans mean. And we have the huge advantage of being able to report that verbally. We have a, a language that we can convey specific information. So when I say that actually I do have a stomach ache from something I ate at lunch, you probably had stomach aches before and you know kind of how I'm feeling even though we don't know exactly because I've never experienced Aaron's stomach ache and Aaron's never experienced mine. So you can see how the, even within the same species there's, there's challenges with this. Then you go to a different species and then it's a whole, you know, whole new challenge because they cannot or do not report in a specific way verbally how they're feeling. Now, does that mean we throw our hands up and say it's a waste of time thinking about emotions? Well, scientists did that for a long time, for much of the 20th century, the whole behaviorist era and, and, and B.F. Skinner and that lot. Um, they repudiated the idea of trying to interpret animal emotions. It, it was a black box and we don't go there. So we just assume they don't have them. Um, that we have emerged from that era now and now scientists are, are studying and talking about not just emotions in bats or, or, or feelings that bats may have or some other, or elephants being very caring about their young or taking an interest in their, de in their dead but also even things like sexual pleasure in flies. I mean, you know, we're really expanding the horizons of the potential feelings and experiences that animals may have. 
I'm wondering what sort of what sort of considerations I mean should there if if we if we're saying that you know my my son it's important that for me that my son is healthy and happy and whatnot and it's important that my spouse is happy and healthy and whatnot and it's important that people I know are happy and healthy and I, I you know, I, I, I wish the best for them. Um, and and the, the animals that are in my life that are non-human animals. Um, you know, how does it make sense to extend that? I mean, how far do we extend that circle of kindness, I guess? Yeah, great question. I mean, it, it really depends on the species. It depends on the biology. Some species are more intensely social than others. Um, and where you find high sociality, you can expect there's more likelihood to have those kinds of feelings that you're just describing. You know, a species that comes immediately to mind is the elephant. Uh, elephants, of course, there's two species known, African and Asian. Um, they live long lives. They have big brains. They have intense social connections uh, that include not just their own immediate kin, but a family group. So cousins and uncles and nieces and that sort of thing. And every once in a while, different individuals may migrate into or out of the group. In the case of elephants, it's a matriarchy and males tend to wander off and become more loners during much of their lives. But the females hang out in, in clusters of 10, 15, 20. Um, and you got to figure over the course of the decades that they know each other, they form intensely close relationships. And you can see their behaviors when things go wrong, when a, a young one gets mired in the mud, um, when uh, there's a, a poacher catches somebody or, or, or there's even been these horrible culling operations. Uh, the intensity of the emotions expressed in these animals is, is undeniable. And so we, we can't, because of that whole privacy issue, we can't know for sure exactly how they're feeling, but we can look at everything and we can actually even measure cortisol and other hormones in their bloodstream that are linked to emotional feelings. And we, we see an animal who's, who's just experiencing things in the same realm of intensity that we can experience when we suffer a terrible loss or when we suffer a joyous event, well, not suffer a joyous event, when we experience a joyous event. Um, you know, so looking at the evidence without, uh, granted, without having the benefit of being able to live inside the other individual, we would do, I think, ourselves an injustice, and certainly elephants an injustice if we denied elephants had the same, the same sorts of suites of social feelings and emotions that we can have. So that's elephants. What about herrings? Um, what about rabbit fish? I mean, rabbit fish are known, they're reef fish. They work together in reefs. Uh, they have a, a fascinating little team teamwork kind of relationship where two rabbit fish will forage in a pair. Uh, they're they're algae eaters, so they feed in the in the reef, and it's it's dangerous to have your head down poking around, uh, nibbling bits of algae off the reef because you can't really see what's going on. And a big predatory fish like a grouper or a moray eel might be coming and might try and catch you. Wouldn't it be nice if you had someone swimming nearby who was uh, head up, watching out, looking out, and, and looking out for you? And indeed, that's what these pairs of rabbit fishes of several species have been shown to do. They, uh, while one forages head down in the reef, there's another one looking up, uh, looking out, playing lookout. That individual is foregoing food, foregoing gratification until a little later when they switch off, they pair up and they take turns. Uh, but by doing that, by that, that little virtuous act, um, that one's companion gets to forage more safely. And then as uh, the reciprocal thing, when the other one does it, they, 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 the other one gets to forage more safely. So it's an example of a nice relationship. What kind of emotions accompanies that? I don't know if it's known if they work with the same individual over long periods, I suspect so. And it's certainly been shown that fishes have individual recognition skills, they have good memories. Um, and that, uh, so I, I think we should be very open to the idea that a fish based on this sort of behavior can develop a bond and maybe a loving relationship with another fish. Um, there was another example I wanted to give, and I, I forget what it was, but uh, um, certainly fishes uh, have gesturing and they work together cooperatively over long periods in some cases. So uh, see these relationships involve specific individuals who recognize each other, who maybe depend on each other. We should expect in situations like that, that they, they also have emotional feelings. Oh yes, I, I, I know what the study I wanted to just mention is, we know from, scientific study as well as anecdotal observation that being petted feels really good to some fish. Touch is a very powerful uh, communication tool in nature. And a lot of animals use touch as a way of, of cementing the relationship, of, of tightening the bond, 
showing another that I accept you, I like you, I'm glad you're part of my social circle. And we see that across mammals, we see it in, uh, in birds, there's more growing evidence for reptiles and possibly amphibians, and we certainly see it in fishes as well. So all vertebrates show these phenomena. You get to invertebrates, you know, octopuses, crabs, insects, they're further from us evolutionarily, so it's more, a little tougher to make some uh, conclusions, but we can still do some studies and find some surprising results. Do you mind if I give you three questions and you take them however you want? And uh, you I don't speak. mind, but I'm terrible at remembering more than one question at a time, so I may have to ask you to remind me. That's fine. Okay, so my, my first one is the idea of the brain size has something to do with the inner lives and it makes you know if, if an animal has a smaller brain then they're less intelligent or they're less caring or whatever the second one is you know what about domesticated animals like cows or chickens or horses or sheep or you know whatever and the third is um well i'll save the third for later so let's just focus on brain size and then domesticated animals and take them in whichever order you want sure just comment on brain size i mean um there's other things than intelligence that are that influence brain size everything else being equal maybe brain size is meaningful in terms of intelligence but consider that some animals it benefits them to be small and certainly back to bats and a lot of birds you know animals who have to fly you don't want to be too heavy you're going to burn up too much fuel so they've been naturally selected through evolutionary time to be small and light and so uh but that doesn't mean they can't pack a lot of intellect into that small brain um so brain size is a limited criterion by which to judge intelligence. Uh, I think uh, sociality, back to that, that thing we were just talking about where animals interact, that's a more predictable one. That's a, a better guide for intelligence. Um, animals are smart at what's useful to them. Even the smallest animal with the smallest brain, if there's some particular behavior that really benefits them, such as a little fish who, can, who benefits by knowing how to jump from one tide pool to another, having a good brain for spatial memory and mental mapping is really useful for that little fish with a tiny little brain. So brains are surprisingly good at doing solving problems if it's useful to the animal to do so. so and you know, if we, if we were to just rely on brain size as sort of the measure of intellect and worthiness, well, we need we would need to accept we need to accept that we may not be the smartest because we're our brains are among the biggest and they're relatively among the biggest, but they're not the biggest brains. There's quite a few animals, whales, uh, dolphins, um, elephants who have bigger brains than we do. Shall I go on to domesticated animals? Um, I, I guess uh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, what, in in what... particular, I'm well, in particular, I'm wondering because like in domesticated animals, like cows, for example, cows, I mean, it's, it, it occurs to me that domesticated animals are pretty non-timid of humans. I mean, they, they, they seem to in, at least almost enjoy the company of humans. And yet at the same time, um, they're killed and eaten by many, many, many people and in factory farms and cave hoes and whatnot. I mean, does it, does it seem, I mean, it seems weird kind of to me to, to love your cat and eat your cow, I guess. I don't, how, how, do you, how do you rationalize that? Well, I don't really rationalize it, uh, but I grew up in a society where eating animals was the norm as, as did you. And uh, you know, I made a personal choice as I believe you did to stop doing that. Um, and that choice was informed by what I know about animals. And when I look at them, I, I see that I see a creature who maybe doesn't have the same experiential world than I, that, that I do, uh, but he or she has a meaningful experiential world uh, that includes the capacity to feel pain and to suffer. I don't like that. I don't want them to do that, uh, not on my behalf. So uh, if I can, if my behavior can reduce the amount of suffering that they may incur in their lives, uh, all the better. So um, as for domestication, um, yeah, I mean, uh, generations of being living around humans, I guess they, they maybe lose some of the fear that wild animals have. It's, uh, we're always reminded about the, the, the intrinsic fear that wild animals have of us. And I, I have to say, we don't have the perfect control for that experiment, but I mean, we've kind of violated any kind of trust that animals may have originally had in us. You go to islands where animals have not been encountered, not encountered humans for thousands of years, if ever, and you find the animals are 
not fleeing us. Uh, I spend a lot of time in nature, bird watching, nature watching, looking at snakes, frogs, you name it. I, I love it. I never get tired of it. Nature's never boring. It's fascinating. And I, and I always feel a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, I want to apologize for my species when these animals fear me. They, they move away quickly as fast as they can. Uh, they have a, it's a smart policy to have is just assume all humans are bad humans. Most of us aren't. But we do so much, uh, so much wrong to animals, and we've con we've done that through our history that they have a natural fear. You take an animal like a cow or a pig or a chicken um, and put them in a sanctuary where people are friendly to them and they have a good life, and they they often the, whatever fear they had of us earlier dis dissolves, um, and it's nice to see that. So you know, animals are very adaptive and they're flexible over time. They they can become more or less afraid of us depending on their circumstances. So you talked a little bit about not, you know, participating in the killing of animals. I'm curious, when did, when did this occur in your life? Was this like when you were a 10 year old or 20 year old or, and what was the, what was the process by which you decided, I guess I'm just going to eat plants from now on? Yeah, I wish it had been when I was 10. Uh, I was not till I was 25 that I made a decision that was waiting to happen. Uh, my parents were animal lovers from my earliest memory, and I very quickly, like a sponge, absorbed that. Uh, but I also feel like I had a, an internal love of animals and fascination for animals that was uh, bo inborn, you know, nature-nurture combination. Uh, but um, I, and I grew up with this subconscious awareness that eating animals or eating meat was something a little wrong about that and uh, but it wasn't until I was uh, 25 years old uh, you know just finished my undergraduate biology degree that I I realized that it was time to make a switch because this was just not consistent with my my own personal beliefs to to eat animals so I stopped eating animal meat and then you know uh, I, I realized well milk and eggs the animals who produce those are tre not treated any better and they also go to slaughterhouses so if I'm going to be ethically consistent, I, I need to stop eating that stuff too. And I quickly divested myself of that, um, you know, and that sets one on a path of, uh, of, of um, consciousness and awareness uh, and a very meaningful path. People think it's such a sacrifice. It's like, it's such a reward. It's such a great feeling. You feel like you're making a real difference, not just for the planet, but individual animals. And so that's been a very key central part of my life uh, has, has been one who, works for animals and tries to make their world better and uh, puts puts their you know their own personal lifestyle to be consistent with that with that uh, attempt with that effort so we're get, we're getting close to the end of our time but I, I want to touch on something that's going on right now um, it's June the 9th 2020 and all around the world there are people gathering um, in the cities, in, in the towns, to have discussions about some some atrocity that recently happened, and uh, to 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 one of us, to George in particular, um, but to many. And um, I'm wondering if you can reflect upon the emotional lives of animals, and maybe maybe how that relates to to humans as far as the freeze response, the flight response or run away scared and the fight or anger response versus um, kind of the patience or kindness response, which is able to temper these, these, these more perhaps instinctual emotions. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I, I appreciate you bringing up the whole George Floyd situation. It, 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 it gives me um, hope when I see that uh, my species can rise up and recognize an injustice and clamor and organize to make change. And I look at the history of human social behavior, the recent history, and I'm very encouraged by the fact that we no longer have an institutionalized slave trade. Yes, it's human slavery and it's terrible and it shouldn't happen, but it, we don't have, it's not like accepted and there's not legislation supporting it. Um, we, you know, it's barely been a century, and in some cases, it's a lot less since we, almost all countries gave the vote to women. Uh, you know, the suffrage movement, uh, civil rights. Yes, there are still imbalances, and thank goodness we're trying to address them. And it's too bad we have to because we should have got that fixed by now. But nevertheless, in the course of a century, sometimes decades, 
uh, we can bring about fundamental sweeping social change driven by a, a sense of right and wrong, you know, justice. Uh, these are movements of justice. So that gives me hope that uh, the biggest social movement of all is yet to happen, um, that, and that is the movement to emancipate animals from human exploitation. It's the toughest of all the ones that we've 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 um, done in the past, uh, and there's other ills that need addressing. And I'm glad that we're addressing those because they don't have to be mutually exclusive. It's not like you have to hang up the animal issue to go and protest for Black Lives Matter. Uh, in fact, it, it, they go hand in hand. They uh, they support each other in in many ways because they they allow us to recognize injustices and to recognize that we need to correct those. So um, I'm guardedly optimistic uh, that we will continue to grow the social awareness and the, the justice awareness of, of our treatment of animals and that we'll make change. It's definitely unprecedented human awareness of these issues, uh, that issue now than it's ever been. So that gives me some hope for more rapid change in the future. With, with that said, and I really appreciate that, Jonathan, can I ask you one final question before we say goodbye? Of course. I hope I hope you you this you, you take this in a, a kind way as far as you know there are many people who are religious and they follow various religious traditions and practices and whatnot. Um, and um, so the question is, are animals conscious in the way that we are? Do they have souls in the way that we do? Do do they? Are they just automaton? Are, are they to be dominated by us or is it our dominion? Or, or you know, what are your reflections on that? Well, probably my previous uh, comment uh, predicts what my reflections are on that. Uh, you know, the history of humans' attitudes towards animals has been a history of unestimation, underestimation, excuse me. We've underestimated them right and left time and again. And the more we examine their lives and, and witness what they do, uh, the more we find their lives are complex. Not necessarily more like us, although in the sense of being complex socially and emotionally and cognitively, yes, that does make them more like us. Uh, but you know, we, they, the, the, the bottom line for me, Aaron, is that they have lives that matter to them. Um, and that's so clear to me, crystal clear. We may argue about where we draw the line on whose life has meaning. You know, does an amoeba's life have meaning? You know, uh, does a little fly's life that have meaning? You know, the, where, where do you draw the line? But wherever you draw it, draw it in pencil because, uh, you know, as we get more information, we may find we want to move that line. Uh, I prefer to give the benefit of the doubt where there is doubt and, and that if I find a, a fly in my house, if I can trap the fly in a container and move him or her outside, you know, that's, that's something that it's worth doing. And I, I gotta say that that doesn't just help the fly. I, I actually feel a, a bit of liberation of my own spirit when I do that. It's actually beneficial to me. It gives me a good feeling. I'm part of this earth and I can make my own decisions about who I help and who I maybe don't help. So uh, I'm getting a little away from your, your question there, but you know, do animals have souls? Well, do humans have souls? We don't know. I think uh, I define the soul as the, the as, uh, or a manifestation of our souls is the fact that when one of us dies, we don't cease to exist because there are people who loved us and who we love and people who know us, who outlive us, who remember us and they may speak of us. So that's what I think of as a soul is that continuing presence that happens for a while, depending on one's impact in the world. It may be for a long time. It may be for centuries or millennia, but inevitably it probably, probably all of us fade away to nothing and there's no memory of us, but we do live on after our, our after our deaths. Uh, and I think that's, that's kind of a nice feature of, of us. And that's certainly not unique to us. Other animals connect with no love, uh, other individuals in their, in their, in their network, in their, in their lives, and they remember them. And so other animals in, by that definition, by my definition of a soul, they too have souls that live on after they die. Jonathan, I thank you so much for all that you've said. I'm wondering if you would be so kind as to share with us some of the things that we could read, perhaps that you've written, um, so we could learn more about the inner lives of animals. I, I, and, and you can share with as many titles as you like. Uh, sure. Well, I guess in, in order, the books that I've written that I'm, I'm proud of and 
uh, I'm, I, I love it if people are interested in reading my books. One is, uh, well, two books on the capacity for animals to enjoy life, to feel pleasure. Shouldn't sound very uh, controversial to most people, but in science, uh, scientists have uh, spent very little time reflecting on the capacity for joy and pleasure. So I've written a book called Pleasurable Kingdom, which came out in 2006, and another one, a pictorial book called The Exultant Ark, which came out in 2011. Both those books are focused on animals' capacity to enjoy life and to feel pleasure. Uh, Second Nature, the Inner Lives of Animals is, as the title suggests, a fairly broad overview of animals' inner experiences, their cognitive, their emotional, social experiences. Uh, that came out in 2010. And then uh, a, a book focused on the lives of fishes because they're so underestimated um, and so misunderstood by us, yet there's so much really good science showing that they have complex inner lives as well. So that book was called What a Fish Knows, and that came out in 2016. And then the book that I've just finished writing that comes out uh, later this year around November uh, called Superfly, The Unexpected Lives of the World's Most Successful Insects. Uh, I, I've always loved insects, been fascinated by them. They're, they're a tougher cell than say fishes or, or say lions and elephants, way tougher cell, uh, but they have amazing lives and there's a lot of surprises. Uh, so I hope people will take an interest in that book too. All right, thank you so much. And again, we were on the line with Jonathan Balcom, uh, PhD in an animal behavior, author of several books on the inner lives of animals. And if you appreciate content like this on the internet, conversations and such, please click on the thumbs up. Uh, you're also invited to subscribe and put in your email so you get email notifications, put in a comment, share this with other people. And Jonathan, do you have other talks online, I imagine, more of lecture style? Yeah, if you go to YouTube and put in my name, uh, you'll it'll connect you with the number of talks that I've given over the years. All right, well, so thank you so much for your time today, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome, Aaron. A real pleasure talking with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, have a nice afternoon. You too.